Welcome to the Modern Husbands Podcast, where any combination of Dr. Ross, Christian, and Brian host national experts who share ideas to manage money and the home as a team. Today's topic is how to argue less about money. And our guest is Nate Assel, founder of the Financial Therapy Clinical Institute. Nate is a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified financial therapist. He specializes in couples, emotions, and money, and financial trauma. As a past board member of the Financial Therapy Association, he has been featured in numerous outlets such as CNBC, USA Today, TD Ameritrade, and Money Geek. Enjoy today's show. Nate, we, we are thrilled that you joined us today, and uh, I am in particular looking forward to this conversation between two outstanding financial therapists, um, yourself and uh, our co-host, Dr. Ross. Uh, Christian is, as we speak, testifying in Connecticut for a financial literacy bill. Uh, Nate, I, I want to uh, make sure our listeners are aware that we are uh, later in the podcast going to address strategies uh, that they can use to reduce how often they argue with their spouse about money. So we promise to get to that. But uh, I know that uh, I need to hand this off to, to Dr. Ross because the conversation uh, between you two is going to be enlightening for me and surely our listeners. Yeah. So let's uh, let's back up a little bit. Uh, Nate, uh, I'm so glad to have you on and to be able to talk to you about everything you're doing. Um, so why don't we just start off with just kind of walking us through your professional background, what you do, uh, who you see, and I know you just launched this awesome new um, financial therapy clinical institute. So I want to hear about that as well. Yeah. Um, so my background, I come from couples and family therapies where I got my master's. Um, I have been lucky to kind of find financial therapy early in my career. Um, and so I've been able yeah. to focus my education, focus my skills towards helping people um, with with money. Um, probably the two biggest areas that I work with is couples and financial conflicts. Um, so having fights about money, right, with couples. And the other one is helping people with significant financial trauma. Um, mm. Financial trauma is something that is typically underdiagnosed, and there isn't really a diagnosis for it, quite honestly, but there, it's not something that therapists or financial planners are great at talk, talking about. And so I do a lot of work of helping people learn to experience money outside of the context which the trauma might have made them feel. Um, so there's there's a lot of overlap and I you know do a lot of stuff in between as well. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, for our for our listeners, can, I know you said it's not financial trauma is not diagnosable. It's so it's not in the DSM like five or anything, right? Mm -hmm. But can, can you uh, give us or give our readers a little bit uh, more for a definition of what financial trauma is, like what what that looks like or how that manifests for an individual or for a couple or yeah. So trauma is something that I think is a word that gets thrown out a lot. And it's a really important word because it does describe a lot of experience. Um, in the effort to keep it money related, I'm gonna use a little bank analogy. Um, okay. All of us uh, in, our, in our mental health life, in our relationship life, in our money life, we have events that are like withdrawals from a bank account, stressors, um, conflict, something happens and it's just it's just rough um, a lot of times we're able to rely on money that's already in that account deposits we've made over time maybe through you know personal fulfillment activities maybe through our friends and our families those external resources we have uh, maybe things like our uh, intergenerational wealth um, you know our different privileges and identities, all of these things we can think of as deposits into our bank account. And of course, life eventually has things that make us withdraw. Trauma is what happens when life is withdrawing and we do not have the funds, uh, those internal or external resources to deal with those withdrawals. Um, I love this analogy. <laughs> yeah. And so what happens is uh, we, we go into the negative and there's overdraft fees Right. And what happens is we we have to work extra hard to get back to the point of like homeostasis or flat. Right. Trauma is also um, where our brain does a lot of taking over of our responses. 
So most people might have heard of like fight or flight responses when it comes to survival mm-hmm. situations. The thing is, is our brain struggles to identify the difference between physical danger and emotional danger. So even if we're not like actively fighting off a tiger or being or running away from a lion in the jungle, like our <laughs> you know, evolutionary uh, brain tells yeah. us, um, uh, losing our job, uh, growing up in poverty, having a major financial catastrophe, it has your brain still deposits the same cortisol hormone. Our bodies still respond. Our heart rate goes up. Our blood pressure goes up. Um, and there's decades of research on trauma. Um, the problem is, is we don't often see our financial life as having traumatic effects, but absolutely does. And it's also not just like what I would say, like major things like poverty or like, you know, I lost $15,000. Like this, it's not just the big hits that count. It's little hits that build up over time. Um, so like, they're like little traumas, but they're cumulative. Right. Um, yeah. I, there's a whole lot of times where people like, well, I didn't, like, I didn't grow up s- super poor on, or on, you know, welfare or anything. Why do I have so much experience? And then honestly only takes a little bit of digging. And then we find out that, you know, mom and dad used to fight about money all the time, or um, dad had a gambling issue or um, money just never seemed to be around. And what happens, these messages get, they're like little baby withdrawals. Um, <laughs> and if they happen once or twice, most of us, I think, can recover and bounce back. Right. But so it's a couple dollars here or there. You know, it's not a big hit. Mm-hmm. But yeah. But those dollars add up. It's just like, you know, going buying that, you know, $5 Starbucks every day. Right. <laughs> yeah. It keeps adding up. Right. So that financial trauma is something that I see all the time in people. Most people don't have a name for it. Um, and that's mm. fine. What's important is that we rebalance their banking system so that they can have a plan of getting out of that uh, mental health debt. <laughs> mental. No, I really love this analogy. Um, I, I, I'm going to steal it. I'll credit you, but I'm going to steal it. I <laughs> think and explain um, financial trauma to like my students and stuff because I mean I think it's such an important concept. And as you said there's so many people that are probably going through it that they don't even have a a term for it. They don't even realize it because there are all these little things that, that hit us. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you're talking to them, I'm like, Oh, what are these little financial traumas that I'm going through? Like, how are they adding up in my own life now? Uh, So I guess, I mean, I know there's not a one size fits all for financial therapy when you're seeing your clients, but I guess generally, how do you go about addressing that? Sure. Um, A big A big, well, there's a couple of things that I do with most of my clients. Um, One that I think comes up almost always is we need to get some stabilization skills. And all that really means is we need to help them recognize, oh, this is trauma brain. Or this is the part of me that probably doesn't really match with my values or what I want to do. It's just that automatic response. And so... One thing I kind of go to, and it's pretty effective, is some real basic mindfulness skills. Um, Reason for that being is um, when our brain is having trauma brain and we're operating from our amygdala and we're reacting, um, one of the best things we can do to recenter ourselves is to get in touch with our senses. And so I typically start, especially if they have significant trauma symptoms, I'll typically start with like, okay, Um, I want you to pay attention to what you're feeling right now, these really big feelings, okay? And now I also want you to look around the room and tell me five things that you see, four colors that you see, three sounds that you hear, two things you can smell or taste, and really spend like 30 seconds with a texture you can touch. What does it feel like? Um, You know, is it it heft? Is it it like thick and solid? Or is it more light and airy? Does it have a temperature? 99% 99% of the time, people will, I, then I'll ask them, like, how do you feel com- before compared to after the activity? 99% of the time, they say, I feel a little bit more calm. I'm like, it's probably because your brain, when, when you force it to pay attention to senses, your brain recognizes you aren't in danger. There isn't a tiger in the room. And 
I, I would hope not. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and that process, it's, it's not like it's a magic pill that's going to, I'm not feeling bad anymore, but it's usually enough to keep us off the edge of like spiraling. Um, mm. Other things that I'll do a lot with uh, financial trauma is when they have some of those emotion regulation skills and we've, we've spent some time uh, training them to respond to their emotions differently. Um, Cause I think that's a huge thing. Honestly, we're going to have a whole session on that. Um, but when they are able to say, Hey, okay, I'm having these big feelings. I'm not going to shame myself for having these big feelings. There's nothing wrong with me because I have these big feelings. Um, then we might do more of a deep dive, like, where did I learn that this is how I'm supposed to feel? Where did I, when did I first feel scared, angry, lonely, shame, abandoned when I think about X topic? Um, are you in a different place now than when that stuff was happening? Um, and that's another thing that is really common with trauma brain is it's not great at recognizing time. Um, things that happen in the past feel like they're happening in the present, or even if they're not, right? Like, even if I'm not in the same financial situation or powerless situation I was when I was a kid, it still feels like that. And this, that's my current reality based on past experience. And so helping our brain kind of baby steps sometimes, if we like tease out, like, are things different now than when they were then? Like, how can we go back to that place that you were in and that the inner child that you might have that feel, still feels stuck um, mm -hmm. at the age of 10 in, in poor or at the age of 10 and feeling lonely and say, hey, I'm an adult now and I have adult resources and I've, I've got you and together we can be in a different situation. Um, anyway, I'm rambling a little bit, but. There's a lot of it, things that we can do. It's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know we, we can't, we don't have time to go through <laughs> um, tons and tons of different sessions and stuff. But I mean, I think it is fascinating how you do work with it. I'm, I'm curious then how that kind of transitions into, um, since I know you come from kind of a systemic therapeutic background here, uh, you know, you're working with a couple, you're working with families. How does that kind of transition into couples financial therapy? Yeah. So um, oftentimes what I'll do is in exploring how they experience conflict, I'll I'd be asking a lot of these questions like, how did each of you grow up with money? What were some of the messages that you got? And not just messages, but what are some of the resulting feelings? I do a mm. lot of feelings work, a lot of emotions as it relates to money, because I think that's where people get stuck. And it's also where we can do a lot of good motivating work or our emotions can be very motivating. So um, I'll, I'll be asking a lot of these personal finance digging questions like, okay, where did, you know, I'll, let's talk about your money story or your money past. Um, and then try and bring it into the present context of knowing what you know about you. And most importantly, what, knowing what you know about your partner, is there a, maybe a little gentler way we can approach the disagreement here is there something like oh okay they're experiencing this because of this thing it's not because of me um <clears throat> that in itself might be enough for some couples another really common thing i will do uh is map out what we call the couple conflict cycle which is just what was that the couple conflict cycle oh couple conflict okay and it is um <laughs> i actually have it uh, right here, and you're not going to be able to see it if you're listening, but it's just a little infinity symbol that I draw out with couples. Yeah, it looks like an infinity sign. <laughs> yeah, and all it is doing is showing the conflict patterns that show up for couples when they have a fight. So um, just real basic idea is an incident happens, you know, the garage door breaks, something happens, <laughs> life happened, um, <laughs> and it makes it makes uh, both partners feel things and those feelings lead to certain thought patterns and those thought patterns lead to behaviors. And this is the kind of the key part is our behaviors reinforce what my partner is feeling and then they think and do certain things and their behavior reinforces what I'm feeling and it becomes this infinity loop of 
feeding into each other. And so what I'll do is I'll map out, all right, what are each of you feeling? What are the common feelings that tend to come up? And I try and get behind just angry and frustrated and be like, okay, what about fear? What about sadness? What about insecurity? What about some of those vulnerable emotions? Um, Mm. And then map out, okay, when you're feeling that, what are you thinking to yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm a failure. She always does this. Um, You know, I, this is always going to be a problem, things like that. And then I'll ask, all right, when you're feeling and thinking that, you know, your partner and I am not, we're not mind readers. All we see is behavior. Um, If I was a fly in the wall, how would I know that that's what you're feeling and thinking? I don't know what I do. Okay. Let's ask your partner. Um, Well, they get this stern look and they have a tone of voice. Um, and it makes sense when you explain it like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what, and kind of maybe the final point I do want to drive home here is the problem isn't to your partner. The problem is the cycle. Mm. It, everyone is human. Everyone has a money story. Everyone has emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. The problem becomes when our cycle feeds into our partner's cycle. And so now when we have it mapped out, we can suddenly it's not me versus you. It's you and me versus the problem. And it's kind of, I always think I'm super nerdy and I like think of like battles and stuff. Um, <laughs> I always think of like this monster in the middle and we got partner X coming in on one side and partner Y coming in on the other side. Um, we're coming at it from different angles, but we're still trying to attack the problem. Um, I'm and that gonna, monster's the problem. Yeah. I'm going to work on, responding differently to my emotions, uh, changing my thought patterns and changing behaviors. And that's going to feed into the monster less. Um, Mm. You are going to do the same thing and that's going to feed into the monster less. And even though I can't control what you do, I know that by working on my stuff, it actually helps you as well. Um, So it becomes like a, a shared enemy, I think. Yeah. A quick moment of appreciation for our sponsor, Money Marriage University who deliver self-paced online courses for couples designed by national therapy and financial planning experts. Money Marriage You experts understand how to help couples hurting from arguments and tension around money. Money Marriage You offers a wide variety of online courses at different price points. Take your first step toward healing your pain by visiting moneymarriageuniversity.com. Once again, you can learn more at moneymarriageuniversity.com. Now back to the show. So, I mean, so you say, you know, everyone's coming into the relationship with their money stories. They're coming in with their money beliefs and their their money stuff, mm-hmm. you know, right? Uh, so when should couples begin to have these conversations about money then? Um, you know, it's, <laughs> I hear a lot of people advocating like first date. I'm like, eh, that's probably first date. not realistic. Um, <laughs> I think any time that there is a shared financial responsibility, it's important to have starting to have these conversations. Couldn't that be the first date with, you know, shared, uh, (laughs) you know, buying food or, you know, uh, something like that? You know, you're you're right. It it could be. Um, I think especially when you're like having regular bills, like, oh, I live here, I pay rent. Or if I am like, yeah, if I'm paying for every meal, then it's like, hey, we should talk about what our money expectations are, what our money past is. Do we have feelings that come up when we talk about money? Because I value our relationship enough to have hard discussions about things. Um, yeah. So I think the conversations need to increase in frequency and depth the more financially intertwined you are. Mm-hmm. More financially intertwined. So is it when you're starting to feel like, how, how do you know, is it when, when you're reaching those, like, you know, are there specific stages or thresholds, like where you're having more of an emotional reaction to things or. Yeah. I, I think you had, like, if you are noticing, Oh, I'm starting to feel things with money that I don't always feel when I'm just hanging out with friends or, you know, taking mm-hmm. someone on a first date, um, then then you're like, Hey, I'm feeling things and I want to talk about that, or at least it's important to talk about, even if I don't want to. So how can these couples, I guess, kind of first prompt these conversations about money? How can they start 
having these, if they're having these feelings, how can they start that? Yeah. Um, I think a, well, maybe this is too broad of a statement, but I think. We'd start broad and then go. Yeah. Kind of (laughs) uh, in the discovery stage of a relationship when you're learning things about each other and everything's new. I think it's really interesting and be like, how was money treated growing up? Like having some real basic, like money story exposure time. Like, Hey, like, how was that growing up? Like, and how do you think that comes up now? And like, like none of these have to be threatening questions. None, none of them have to do with the relationship yeah. at all. It's just kind of about hearing about your past. So, so what, what's like an example of, I guess, doing that then is like, you just like pour a bottle of, pour a glass of wine and just sit on the couch and be like, Hey, tell me about your money. Like upbringing. Yeah. How do we go about that? Yeah. I think that's actually perfect. Um, (laughs) We we ask these questions all the time about like, where did you grow up and what was it like as a kid? Like that's a normal part of relationship development. All we have to do is add in money. Like just adding in the word money or (laughs) finances to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good starting place. Um, I think especially when couples are are getting to point where they're like either living together or married or like, you know, significantly attached. Um, I think it's really important to start just the same way that, and, um, by the way, my wife is a sex researcher. And so I'm, I'm going to advocate for having conversations about sex as well. Um, well, they're so closely intertwined right but mm-hmm. like sex and money yeah it's super fun um to talk about. And <laughs> the same way like okay so my my wife is a sex researcher quite your date nights must be awesome oh, like, yeah. must our be dinner incredible. conversations are right? perfect like, um, <laughs> people think we're having all sex and money all sex and money boy. <laughs> yeah people think we're having like real deep conversations at the restaurant and like no this is just tuesday night um yeah just trust it. <laughs> so um, you're not suggesting having the money conversations while you're having sex, right? I mean, it's two uh, separate things. You know, I I do not kink shame, <laughs> and if that is your kink, <laughs> go for it. You know. Um. <laughs> so the so anyway, but the example is like she knows a whole lot about sex and sexuality, but we still have a shared sex life, and just because she knows more doesn't mean that I don't have a say, right? Like that would be really inappropriate. She's like, well, I'm a, a bit of the expert in here, so I'll be making the choice and be like, oh, okay, but you know, I want So even if one of you has maybe more financial skills or got different socialization around money, maybe one of you is in the financial field as a um, yeah. you know, in, industry worker or whatever, it doesn't mean that you get to be the default manager. Um, this is a team thing, just like sex. And it is something that requires team work um, and it requires um, authenticity. It requires transparency about what's going on. Um, it requires a commitment to making sure your partner is truly your financial partner. Um, and that takes work. Um, I think there are, th- there are certain systems and structures you can build into your relationship, like having a money date or making sure you're looking at things at least once a month. Um, like that helps, but it's also kind of an inner commitment to say, I am going to be an equal with my partner and I'm not just going to bulldoze decision-making the same way. I think most of us know, I'm not just going to say like, this is what we're going to do sexually. Like I think most of us know that makes you, it's kind of douchey, right? Like we, <laughs> we have to make sure that we are like actually engaging with what does, what does my partner like? What makes us feel most comfortable, right? If it applies yeah. to sex, it applies to money. Um, what the is, same questions for money too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what is my partner like? What makes her, you know, them comfortable? What makes us feel safe? What does closeness look like in this area of our life? Um, how will we know that we're satisfied? Uh, like all of these kinds of things. It, but as you go through that, though, and I, I'm just thinking back to some of my past relationships, the conversations that you're recommending that folks have before they're married, and uh, obviously the depth of those conversations increase as uh, your financial entanglements grow together. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, 
as you're having this, I can think back to this, uh, a girlfriend I had in college for a couple of years where I think if I would have uh, been more cognizant of her behavior or if I would have started to ask questions sooner, um, we would have not wasted each other's time because the, the, when, as you're talking about this, I, I keep thinking about the fact that ultimately you have to get along when you are managing money together. And we're in Cleveland once this, and her car breaks down and it, we go into the auto de- or the whatever the, the, uh, the, to get it fixed, the, uh, have it, have it looked at. And the guy comes out and he's like, look, there's no oil in here. And like the engine's fried, the engine's burned up. And he asked like, when, when was the last time you changed your oil? It's like, what? You have to do that? Like, I'm, I'm thinking, oh my God, are you serious? Like, I didn't say anything, you know? But then the follow-up was what caused me to say, this ain't going to work. She goes, oh, because uh, I asked her, what are you going to do? She's like, oh, daddy will buy me a new car. And the next week she had a brand new car. They were, she was filthy rich. And up until that point, I, my, my, and it, I still feel this way. I don't care how wealthy somebody is. They can have the same values as me. I don't care what they drive or what, but it was at that moment where I realized that you just don't have the same values as me. Um, Cause somebody who doesn't have much money can have that mindset. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad that you brought up having these conversations because the worst thing that can happen is that you don't, you get married and then your wife looks at you and says, well, it looks like you need to be, buy me a new car now. Cause you're the new daddy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, I would, I will say if you hear from your Newly wet partner, you're the new daddy. Um, I would recommend <laughs> I mean, and the finance conversation, right? I think I think there's some things like to figure out. Uh, not that it's bad. Again, I'm not kink shaming, but uh, there are dynamics you will want to make sure you understand. <laughs> um, well, I think I mean I, I know that there, you're, there's a lot of therapists. You know, they talk about sexual compatibility. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I guess this is going into financial compatibility as well. I mean, and it's not always just an immediate you know, um, compatibility. It has to be kind of a learned practice and, mm-hmm. and a negotiated practice as well, you know? Right. Yeah. It, it's just like sex. Like you, you learn things over time as more experience goes on. Um, I will say a lot of, at the risk of being controversial, a lot of time and energy goes into like, yeah, like, like sexual compatibility. Like if I'm not on the same page, then that's going to be an issue. It doesn't have to be. Um, now, if if that's something that's important to you, that's fine. Like you have every right to be choosy. And I encourage people to be choosy in who they want to take on as a significant other. Um, but having different money backgrounds or money beliefs or experiences doesn't inherently mean that the relationship won't work. It just means that, okay, we've got some things to work through together and we get to mm-hmm. decide what are the parts that our individual past, what parts of the, that individual past are things that we're going to bring with us in the future and what are the parts that we're going to have to work to relieve ourselves from. Um, you know, this, this process happens in about everything, uh, parenting, sex, you know, how we fold the laundry. Like there's so many, there's a wrong way. (laughs) I've learned that from my wife, just so we're clear. There's a wrong, there's a wrong way. Okay. Go ahead. We've actually separated our folding, our laundry folding because (laughs) yeah, there's different ways and I don't do it well enough. So (laughs) I just do all of mine. She does all hers. If that's what works for you, like that's how we've negotiated. (laughs) Yeah. You negotiated based on shared values, which that shared value is we don't want laundry to be something that causes a divorce. Right. (laughs) And so, yeah, I, I, so, you know, as you're talking through this, I mean, everything obviously makes sense. I mean, there's going to be things in your relationship you have to work through. You're not going to be naturally compatible at all things at all times. Mm -hmm. Um, But obviously, you know, these things build up. I mean, and there's only so much that, money that we have in our own bank accounts, emotional bank accounts. Right. And eventually through all the deposits, you're, you're, you're just left with nothing. So I bring this up because I, I want to, I want to understand what it is that triggers most money fights. And, and as you work through this, um, you know, explain in addition to that, like, are these things that can be worked through? Are these things that, you know, eventually we don't have to talk about it 
every week or every month or every day or whatever. Like we can just resolve this, come to an understanding. So then moving forward, we're on the same page. Yeah, it's it's a fair question. I I don't know if I believe that there comes a day when we resolve things. To be in a relationship is to work at it. Um, I have had the experience both personally and clinically where it isn't what you're fighting about, it's how you're fighting. Um, now, mm. if, That's a powerful statement there. That is. That's a really powerful statement. If we can, if we can look at our couple conflict cycle and we can reduce the way that we trigger and, and feed into each other, a lot of times, um, I, would say, I would say the majority of times, we are able to negotiate and resolve conflict um, most of us, uh, well, I don't, I'm not going to say that. Many of us have the skills to problem solve. Um, we do it all the time at work. Like conflict or disagreement is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be really positive. Um, but if we are fighting in a way that separates us, doesn't make us a team anymore, it distances me from you. Um, that's when a disagreement be, can become a deal breaker. Um, and if we can change how we approach conflict, suddenly the w- world is our oyster. We can take on any disagreement. We can take on anything because we know that we have each other's backs. We know that we respect each other enough to listen. We value our relationship to get help when necessary. Um, I think those are green flags that we're trying to build in a relationship. Mm. That is powerful. That, that, uh, that probably gives a lot of listeners hope who may be going through some turmoil with their uh, significant other right now. So what, what are some examples of, and I'm, I'm sure like to give you an example of what I'm looking for of how to be a great listener, but what are some examples of how you can argue in a way where it's not really an argument, it's more of a discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a skill that I really like. It's not it's not perfect, but it's a really good skill. It's called the speaker listener technique. Um, mm. If you just if any listener just YouTube searches speaker listener technique, um, uh, the creator is under the organization Prep Inc. Uh, P R E P, and uh, it it was created by some couple therapists. Basically, it's a fancy way of doing a talking stick we're like okay i'm going to uh i'm gonna hold the stick and while i have the stick um back to I, the kindergarten walk like talking stick yep. kind of yeah okay. there's a reason that it works um <laughs> and and okay the, the real thing that we're going for is it is incredibly difficult if not impossible to solve a conflict if i'm not heard or if i don't feel heard mm. so this structure allows both of you not to agree with each other, but allows you both to feel heard, understood, and potentially validated. Mm. When we are validated, when we are like, hey, you're, <laughs> I see where you're coming from, that like it makes sense to me why you would feel X. Even if I think you're wrong, even if I disagree, I understand why. Suddenly you are no longer my enemy. You are not the thing threatening me. The problem is this, the problem is external to us. Um, so highly recommend the speaker listener technique. Um, it's not perfect. It's not going to be how you talk to each other all the time, but if you don't have any skills, that's a really good starting point. Um, so, you know, other things you probably heard. So you, you will want to do some active listening, which just means I'm going to repeat back things I hear you say, um, using both a mixture of your words and my words to make sure that we're on the same page give you opportunity to clarify if I'm like, Oh, am I not understanding what more, like, is there more that would be helpful for me to understand? Um, and you know, it takes a lot of work, but it's also super beneficial. I, so when you're going through these strategies, are they, are they something that both couples are aware of and that they recognize that they need to practice these strategies or is it, you know, kind of like, um, nuanced enough where the partner doesn't recognize what you're doing because it would go better that way. 
Uh, no, I, there's no reason to hide it. Yeah. <laughs> Say, like, I want to use the speaker listener because I want holding to. The you're holding the speaker stick. Yeah. Right? Or whatever. <laughs> it you know, requires whatever you use, whether it's a stapler or. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that uh, I will recommend is uh, for couples is to use something that they both have a positive attachment to. Because sometimes I'll, I'll ask them to practice and they'll, they'll like, grab the remote because it's nearby. I'm like, does the remote like because some people have strong feelings about a remote about like what <laughs> um is it the remote date or is it what the remote can do it, yeah it's what it represents <laughs> yeah. but um it i laugh because yeah <laughs> i sympathize with that yeah. I, oh i'm with i'm with that because that remote dictates whether we're watching a hallmark movie or mm-hmm. whether we're watching a Bruce Willis movie. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah, you're speaking <laughs> to the choir. <laughs> I agree on the content. For me, it's always the volume. And I'm like, like I can't hear. And she was like, it's too loud. And then we were like, subtitles, there's no subtitles. I'm like, I'm an old man. She's like, you're 30. I'm like, I don't care. So it's, <laughs> it's yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and I appreciate you saying this because uh, if this resonates with, with me for a number of reasons. But First of all, I need to go back to that, you know, that original statement that you made that that was profound. And it's it isn't what you are fighting about. It is how you are fighting. And it's not something that we learn in school. It's not something that uh, is is a part of any sort of formal training that you're going to get unless you go out and seek the training. And uh, I've been fortunate enough just to have conversations with ex- all these experts again and again and again, just to be a little bit more in tune with how you know, stupid I can be. Um, so like as an example, uh, you know, our, our, we need to get a car I should, that needs the wrong word. Um, we, we're going to have five drivers soon and we have two cars and it just, it isn't working. We, yeah. we, we would like a third car to make our, our lives easier. And so we're, we're going to, in, in that process, essentially it's going to be the car of one of our children. And there's a, there's an amount of money that we're going to contribute and they can contribute more. And this particular child if it's if there is a range of items from low cost to high cost, this child will pick the high, highest cost item every single freaking time. And my wife always, because she you know, loves her children and she's coming from a place of I want to always give them what they want because I, it makes them happy, wants to do that with the car where I look at it and I have no value whatsoever in a car. You're totally care. opposite. I'm the opposite. <laughs> I, I literally, I grew up... I'm not exaggerating. One of the cars that my parents drove was followed by someone to buy, to put in a demolition derby. And I saw it win the Clinton County demolition derby. (laughs) Like that's how bad those cars are. And so from my perspective is it's a car from A to B, but more importantly, this is a financial lesson. We need to teach him how to manage his emotions and the frustrations or disappointments that come with not getting everything you want so he can begin to prioritize what's most important and walk through that process. Mm-hmm. If I would have just banged her on the head with that, it would not have worked. I started with validating. Mm-hmm. I started with explaining, look, I recognize that in your home, what a value was, was stuff, mm-hmm. always having a new car, leased, whatever. There were there was not really a consideration of the, the bigger picture on how that would impact the development of you as a person or where else that money could have been used. Mm-hmm. So your that's your money story. I understand it. Can can we perhaps have a conversation about why I, I think it's important for our child not to get the car he wants? And it, it went it went over better that way. I didn't get slapped. I didn't get yelled at. <laughs> you know, it was an actual thoughtful conversation that concluded uh, in a way that's in the best interest of our family. Yeah. So that's a long-winded way of saying that, like, regardless of how you are applying your profound statement of it isn't what you are fighting about, it's how you are fighting, that that in itself mm-hmm. can reduce the friction, the frustration that comes when any two people have to manage two complicated lives and then the complicated lives of children as well. A special thanks to our guests and, of course, to all of our listeners. Don't forget to click subscribe wherever you download your podcast. Give us a rating and share our podcast with others. And check out our website at modernhusbands.com where you can find articles, courses, toolkits, and other resources to help you and your partner manage money in the home as a team. Until next time, be well.